Yes, actually, I'm Benjamin Mee, and I know what you're all thinking right now is, yep, that guy does look a lot like Matt Damon. <laughs> it's a very surreal experience, a very surreal uh, story for me particularly, but um, uh, I'll, I'll just take you through a little bit of uh, how it first evolved, that he came to be saying my name. Um, this picture was taken in about 2005, um, before some of you fellas were born. Um, but also, I'd never heard of Dartmoor Zoo, um, which is the zoo that the film was based on at this time. Um, this, I was living in the south of France. Uh, I was working as a journalist, and uh, I had a column on DIY in the Guardian newspaper. Um, and I did feature articles for glossy magazines. And I was also writing a book about animal intelligence um, which it had taken me about 10 years to work myself into a position where I could do this. I could live in the sunshine in the south of France with my children as a freelancer, get up when I liked, drink, lo drink wine with the locals, and the kids would grow up bilingual. They thought this was a real swimming pool. It's actually an inflatable one. Uh, that building there is my office. Um, the previous occupants were bats and sheep. Uh, some of the bats were still there while I was sending my copy off to The Guardian. Um, and if I needed inspiration for my DIY column, we were building a little wooden house in the back of the other barn, which is huge. That house is about 10 square metres bigger than the flat in London that we sold to buy the whole place. Uh, and it was absolutely idyllic. Um, I was occasionally sent off around the world uh, to still do magazine articles. Um, this one, it took me 10 years to persuade the editor of um, Men's Health magazine I used to write for that his readers wanted to know what it was like to swim with dolphins and I was the person to send. Sorry, did I say 10 years? It took two and a half years, sorry, to, to, to persuade him to do that one. Uh, but it had taken me 10 years to work into that position where I could do things like that. And uh, there's my little face smiling with the dolphins. And actually, I learned something on that trip that I'm still, uh, did actually feature in my um, book that I'm writing about animal intelligence, which is um, the psychology of social mammals and whether they have a sense of humor or not. And I think that elephants, dolphins, and apes not only play with each other a lot, but they actually have a sense of humor. They deliberately make each other laugh, and that's really important. That's what my book's about. Uh, and there they are making me laugh. Um, so people asked me in those days, if I, if I won the lottery, what would I do differently? You know, and I said, quite honestly, I wouldn't change a thing. I would stay exactly where I am, writing this book, writing these columns in the, in the newspapers um, until the book was finished, living in the sunshine with my children who grew up speaking fluent French much, much better than I did. Um, and I'd probably buy a real swimming pool because that inflatable one was a pain. But uh, otherwise, the lottery wouldn't have affected. I, was, I thought I had my dream job, my dream life. But then, of course, as the older people here know, events come along and change everything. And in 2005, um, my father died, which meant that my mum had to think about selling her house, which was um, a sort of five-bedroom house in Surrey, uh, too big for, for one um, old lady on her own. And moved to a smaller cottage. And we thought, well, this is a shame if mum has to do that because, you know, then all of her five kids and 16 grandkids wouldn't get to go and see her all together at one time. And we thought, well, why don't, my sister came up with the idea, why don't we just buy an even bigger house? My sister would move in with her six children and my, maybe my brother with his two kids and my mum and they'd all be like one huge commune and everyone would live together. And I thought, well, this is a fine idea because mum doesn't speak French. She's not going to do this in France, that's for sure. So I gave it the thumbs up from abroad and uh, sat back. And over the next year or so, my sister kept sending details of big houses that were broken down, that need a lot of work, uh, which is what we were looking for, with nice big gardens and that would, that would break up into, into different flats. And eventually she sent this picture, which is a 13-bedroom house um, in one of the nicest parts of the, uh, of the UK, the South Hands of Devon, with a 30-acre garden. And it's very run down, advertised as very run down, need a lot of work. And we thought, this, is, this could work. You know, we could break this up into accommodation for lots of groups of people. 
And then we looked at the details and we turned the page. And on the next page, there were, came with three African lions, seven Siberian tigers, three European brown bears, a pack of wolves, some flamingos, a Brazilian tapir called Ronnie, and this boy, Sovereign the Jaguar, probably the most dangerous animal on the park at the time, because jaguars are incredibly clever and they're really stealthy. You can see Sovereign there. He's, he's always thinking about how to escape and how to eat you. And um, so we just laughed and thought nobody in their right minds goes and buys a zoo uh, as, a, as a retirement idea. But we couldn't stop thinking about it. Said, Only someone really obsessed with DIY and animals would do a thing like that. And then we looked at ourselves and thought, well, that's us really, isn't it? Let's go and have a look and work out what it is and the reason we can't do it. There must be a big reason we can't do it. Big mistake is to turn up there and look at all the things that needed fixing and thinking, well, we could fix this, we could fix that. You know, this is all, this is all doable. It's worked as a zoo before. Why can't it work now? Because it was just about to close down. And then we learned that if it did close down, most of the animals were going to be destroyed because the old fella, who was, you have to be a little bit mad to run a zoo, and he was certainly fit to the bill, um, he bred a lot of the animals with other animals they were related to, and it meant that no other zoo would take any of the animals because any zoo, like Yorkshire Wildlife Park around here, they've got massive enclosures for lions and tigers, but they're not just any lions and tigers. They're special ones that they know where they've come from and they know the, uh, where they're going to put them in the end, where they're, you know, ideally you're trying to build up a healthy population that you could maybe reintroduce into the wild. And these guys, they look lovely, big tigers and bears and lions, but there was no way they were ever going to uh, breed for any other um, a captive breeding program. So if nobody turned it back, nobody kept it running as a zoo, it was going to close down, be made into a nursing home, and most of the animals were going to be euthanized. So suddenly we thought, well, that's really bad. We can't let that happen. That is really a bad thing. Um, I don't think we'll be able to do it, but let's do everything we can to stop that from happening. And we did. And I spent the next six months on the phone uh, from my beautiful offices in the south of France uh, with bats flying past my head, talking to a madman down the phone. And every time that it got tricky, he threatened to shoot me. Um, he was a very, very difficult man to deal with. This is how he managed to not sell the zoo for about five years and chased away every single person who was thinking about buying it, uh, even though he needed to sell it. And also why the zoo was in trouble in the first place, because he had this thing about pointing guns at people and threatening to kill them, which you know, doesn't go down well. But luckily, I was a long way away. I was a good 750 miles away. And as a journalist, I was used to dealing with difficult people. As a businessman, would have put the phone down, but I was a journalist, that's a different mindset. But how do I overcome this problem? So I called the local council and I said, because they have to issue a zoo license, if you do run the zoo, they have to, you have to get a license through them. And I said, I'm trying to do this thing, I'm trying to save this zoo, but the man is a bit mad. And he said, yeah, tell us about it. <laughs> we know that. And I said, is there anyone else there in his camp that I can speak to uh, that isn't him? And then we can move it forward. And she, they said, yes. His sister Maureen, she doesn't work at the zoo, but she, she, has, she will be able to talk to him for you. Uh, so if you talk to Maureen, Maureen talks to him, and that's the way we can move it forward. So for six whole months, I was on the phone from France to Maureen. There'd be a few days waiting in between phone calls, and then finally it would, it would move forward. And then suddenly, in, uh, in amongst all the crying of, the, all of all of my friends and family, apart from my brothers and sisters, thought it was just the worst idea in the world. The more we talked about it, the more upset people got. I noticed that there was a lot of opposition to the idea of buying the zoo. First of all, people laughed like everyone here and us. And then after a while, if you keep on it and say, yes, we really are going to try and buy this zoo, it's like, no, don't do that, it's stupid. So, well, why? What, what exactly is Well, nobody buys a zoo. And you think, well, why not exactly? And they'll tell you, you know, oh, it's because uh, you don't know what you're doing. You say, well, okay, but we employ a curator of animals who does know what they're doing and we have uh, someone else to run the restaurant and you can actually do that as long as you as long as you employ the right people but it seemed to upset people that we were trying to do this sometimes and I found that that was actually one of the most difficult things and I found that more and more in life if you've got an idea that's slightly unusual and you're sure you're right about it 
and you've thought about it, you'll find that all, often some of your friends and your family will tell you, don't do that. And you say, why not? And it's really just because it's unusual. And sometimes it, you can be absolutely right. Even if everyone else is telling you that you can't do something, you could, you could be right by, by uh, sticking to your guns. And this is what we thought. We found, I, I asked everybody who had a problem with it, I said, what is the problem? And if, if, they, if they came up with an answer I hadn't thought of, I'd, I'd think about it and, and uh, make sure I had, a, I, I had a solution. So finally, in October 2006, um, we ended up suddenly being the new owners of the zoo. And it all fell, fell into place at the last minute. Just as we bought it, the bank came along and said, oh, we were going to lend you a load of money to help develop it, to help get your license back. We decided that we won't because we don't lend to zoos. And you'll find that a lot of banks remember at the last minute that they don't lend to zoos because animal charities, um, it looks bad if they have to close you down. So they don't do it in the first place. So suddenly we, had to, we bought it, but we didn't have any money at all to fix it or even keep it going. So we hit the ground with a bit of a problem. And the first thing we did, we thought, well, never mind. Well, some nice lender will come along at some point. First thing we'll do is we'll take an inventory, which is where you count everything that you've got on a list. And we looked at the zoo inventory and said, OK, so this is a 300-seat restaurant. It's about the same size as this. Uh, it's got 300 uh, knives and forks, 300 plates, uh, 300 saucers, and seven cups. So, OK, so where are all the rest of the cups? Where are the 293 other cups then, guys? And the employees, who many of whom were still rela were related to the old guy, said, oh, well, Grandad used to throw those at his sister Maureen after she'd been on the phone to you. <laughs> so he got really cross and just threw the cups at the wall. So we realized it had been very tough at their end as well as at our end. But it also meant we had to spend another £5,000 on a new crockery set for the restaurant, which we hadn't budgeted for, and we didn't have any money anyway. So on our fourth day, I remember this very clearly, um, I was sitting in the big house in the kitchen talking to the head keeper, who was subsequently immortalised in the film by Scarlett Johansson. Um, but I have to say that Robert didn't look anything like <laughs> Scarlett Johansson, and I never kissed him. But I was talking to him about what we might do if I had half a million pounds suddenly fell into my lap. Uh, where was it fences? Is it paths? Is it what, where do we start with the refurbishment? Because we needed to get the license to trade as a zoo back by the summer. And if we didn't, if we miss the summer, you've missed more than just a year, you probably won't have enough money to get through the winter. So it's really important to work out where to spend the money, even though we didn't have it. And suddenly, my brother Duncan came bursting into the room and shouted, one of the big cats is out! This is not a drill! And ran out again. And I thought, well, that's really unusual. Duncan doesn't normally speak like that at all. He never loses his cool in a crisis. He's actually a private investigator, my brother, and he's nerves of steel. I've almost never seen him rattled. He was rattled, and I'm thinking, oh, that's bad. I looked across the table. Robert had gone, as if he'd gone in a puff of smoke. And I knew he'd gone to get the big gun that all zoos have to carry in the event of an escape. And suddenly, all the voices of all those people saying, buying a zoo, you must be mad. I'm thinking, maybe they were right. This is not good. This is a bad start on day four. So I went outside to the sound of roaring and screaming, which sounded a lot like someone being eaten alive by a lion. And I still remember, if I go out onto the back path now from that angle and I look down the path, I can still remember what it's like to imagine that there's a tiger or something and a burst around the corner and come running up to me looking to play. And uh, it's terrifying. But I picked up a shovel at the time and I thought it just felt so heavy. I thought it's not going to help, is it? So I put it down again. Made my way up to the sound of the roaring and the screaming and it wasn't quite as bad as it could have been. What had happened was a young lad who shouldn't really have been there but he, was, he had been taken on at the last minute by um, the old guy had been told to wait outside the Jagger enclosure to clean out the jag. And it's always a two-person job because it's so dangerous if it goes wrong. What you do is you look at the, make sure the animal's outside, you shut the heavy door on the inside of the house, and then you lock it. And then you look at your buddy and you go, check, lock, check, check, lock, check. And then you've made eye contact. You both know the lock is done. 
and then and only then is it safe to open the inside door and go in and sweep. Now, Richard, as his name was, had decided to impress the new owners, he said later in his statement, by cleaning out the jag all by himself. And he shuts the heavy door uh, and makes sure that the animal's on the other side, shuts it down, forgets about the lock, opens the inside door and starts sweeping. And Sovereign, who is the very clever cat, had been waiting eight years for someone to make this exact mistake. And he went over to the door, he heard there's no lock, and he pushed it up with his paws like that. And then he came bursting through, and poor old Richard gets to see, I've done it again, I think. Have I done it? Which one? No, back. Poor old Richard gets to see that coming up under the door. Can you imagine? Amazingly, he, Sovereign didn't pause to kill Richard. He just ran straight past and out because he had a, another part of his eight-year plan was to fight the tigers in this enclosure here. So he could have gone on to Dartmoor, where he'd probably still be on Dartmoor. He could have gone down into the village to the, eat people in the pub, which would have made us look really bad. Um, he could have eaten my children who were playing on the picnic area the day before, but luckily, this was his game plan. And he jumped across a, a moat that's about, the moat wall's about this high, and then that's a five meter moat, and then all the rest is five meter high, electric fence, big cat enclosure that you can't get out of. So it could have been a lot worse. But by the time I got there, it was, uh, the, there was a tiger and a jaguar circling each other. Luckily, instead of there being three tigers, two of them were inside already. And has anyone seen, yeah, a lot of people have seen the film, you know Spar, the old tiger? He was there and he looked at Sovereign and thought, I don't think I want to play with a bouncy young jaguar. I think I'm going to go, go inside and go to bed. And so he was easy to get in. But it was much harder to get Tammy in, who'd only just been let out that day. And Sovereign and Tammy start circling each other. And at this point, Richard turns up and he's going, he came through me. He came through. I was like, yeah, Richard, shut up. Get in the car. You're not helping. And he still has nightmares about this, apparently. Uh, I'm not surprised, imagine. But uh, that was his last day at the zoo. And <laughs> he now works in a pet shop. Then I had to make my first managerial decision, because up until then, I'd been a journalist writing on my own. And suddenly, I was in charge of a team of people with a major emergency. And they said, right, boss, which one should we shoot? I'm like, wait a minute, we don't have to shoot anything just yet. And he said, Grandad would have shot one by now. I'm like, well, Grandad's not here. Let's see how this unfolds. Unfortunately, just as I said that, Sovereign jumped onto the back of uh, Tammy and she turned and smacked him around the head and he spun off into the air and I remember seeing his legs dangling in the air like that as he flew right about as far away as that speaker thing there and facing in the opposite direction and he just carried on walking. Because, you know, like with a domestic cat, they can't admit if they make a mistake. So if one of them falls, if he falls off the radiator because it's too hot, it pretends it meant to hit the floor like that. And it's like, yeah, I was just sniffing the floor. Same with the cat. It's like, with the jag. It's like, I, was, I, meant to, I meant to go over there facing that way. I was using the tiger for the momentum to get there, like that. So he just carried on walking. And again, and luckily, Tammy didn't want to fight him because she'd felt the claws, even though she was twice his size, thought, actually, he's going to hurt me. Predators don't like fighting predators because they're going to injure each other. So they tend to fight prey animals only so that they don't get uh, badly hurt. But we still had a difficult situation. And at this point, the, the guns mentioned again, said, shall we fire a warning shot to calm things down? I'm like, John, I don't think warning shots ever calm things down. Do they put the gun down and let's think of another plan? And this is where I made my second management decision, which was to not ask the boys with the guns what to do, even though they were in charge. Ask everyone down the, down the team. And eventually, the best idea came from one of the volunteers who'd worked very closely with Tammy, the tiger. He said, we need to get her in the house, and she won't go in while she's there unless you shout. She doesn't like men. She doesn't like shouting, because men have shouted at her all her life so far. I thought, well, that's a silly idea. You can't just shout at a tiger. It's not going to work, is it? But let's try. So we've got 10 men, all of the men on the site, me and my brother and all the keepers and a film crew who happened to be there and an IT consultant who was doing a, a visit. And he said it was without doubt the most exciting site visit that he'd ever done. 
And we all shouted at the count of three, Tammy, bad tiger, bad cat, like this. And I'm thinking this is a very silly idea. But again, it was like with a domestic cat, if you squirt a cat with water, the ears would go down and the tail twitch. And it was the same effect. And she was up there and she, she put up with it for about a minute. And then she jumped off the rock, went into a house. We shut the door and we locked it. And then we knew that it was just the Jaguar in the wrong enclosure. And I thought, well, let's get the dart gun. Bring the dart gun. I've seen it on the inventory. And they said, ah, dart gun don't work. It hasn't worked in 17 years. So granddad's loved that gun, but you never have it fixed. I said, well, it's not really a dart gun then, is it? It's just an object that looks a lot like a dart gun. So I called all the zoos in the area, Paynton, Newquay, Bristol, all the different zoos down there. And I said, can we, um, hi there, we've just bought this zoo. Yeah, we don't know what we're doing. Could we borrow your dart gun, please? Oh, hello, hello. Not interested in helping at all. And finally, it was a guy from the West Midland Safari Park, Bob Lawrence, came down. But the next day, which meant I had to spend the, the night in the car, I said, do not get out of the car. If he's escaped, he'll be waiting by the door. But shine the light on the enclosure every 15 minutes to check where the jag is. Because if he starts to get out, we need to come and shoot him. So every 15 minutes, unfortunately, I couldn't see where he was with the torch from the car. And every 15 minutes, I had to get out of the car to be able to shine the torch. And I kept thinking, if I open this door, is this jaguar going to burst in? Or is it going to be, and it was fine. And I go and shine the light, and there's Sovereign in the distance. And I'm like, OK, get back in the car, put on the world service, pretend everything's normal for 15 minutes. And then it's like, I've got to do it again. That's a very long night. But in the morning, Bob came down, darted Sovereign. And that was the first time I stroked a jaguar when we uh, transported him back into the right enclosure. And that was day four and five. And my adrenaline level hasn't really come down from there still, because I'm responsible. If something like that happens again, it's my fault. And uh, uh, it's, a day, it's much more, <laughs> much more uh, risky than I had thought it might be. When, you, when you're thinking about a zoo, you tend to think of all the animals on that side, all the public on that side. Even having public on site is, really, is dangerous enough, because they can trip over and hurt themselves, let alone introduce the concept that there might be big cats there as well. So that was a learning experience and a very useful one. Um, unfortunately, from there, things got significantly worse before they got any better. Um, this is my wife, Catherine, a uh, photograph taken in France. Um, she had a brain tumor diagnosed while we were living out there. And they said, it will come back. And as a health writer, I looked this up and I could see it really will come back. Um, there was a 0.0001% chance of, of, uh, of it not doing within a few years. And most people live less than a year after the first time this is diagnosed. Um, we tried everything we could, we, and we'd actually, she'd been completely clear for two and a half years by the time we got to the zoo. We'd begun to think we had a brain scan every month. We'd begun to think that maybe we were going to be in that tiny, tiny group of people who live a bit longer, in time for them to come up with the right kind of treatment. Brain, brain tumors are really, really difficult to, to treat, especially this kind, particularly this kind. And uh, at Christmas time in 2006, we got a letter from the hospital that said that it had come back in eight different places. And there was nothing we could do apart from nurse her at home. And she died uh, peacefully at home in, at the end of March in 2007. Uh, which obviously was a huge catastrophe for me and my little children who were six and four at the time. And uh, people have often said to me, did I not think of giving up at this point? And I can honestly say, not even for a second did I think of giving up. Because if you give up, then you definitely fail. But if you keep going, even for another hour, and then another hour after that, or another day, then the situation changes gradually. And there's always some part of a problem that you can work your way around and make some progress on. And I knew that we had this thing that was bigger than us that we had to do, which was to get this zoo going. And you could look out the window at that time and see people coming to work, feeding animals. One of the animals died during that time, and another one was born. And it just felt like we were just another family of mammals living in this place. And it was very much in touch with the cycle of life. And it needed us as well to go out there and try and make it work. So 
I, I, didn't, I didn't just completely throw myself back in. I, I eased myself back in um, as a, uh, into the work and made sure that we did get the license um, back so that we could open in the summer, and we did. We opened on uh, July the 7th, 2007, and uh, amazingly, the sun shone for that weekend, and then it was the wettest July in 100 years. <laughs> which meant that nobody came for the rest of July, which puts a bit of a hole in your finances when all of your money comes from July and August. But we had a TV series where they showed the fact that the Jaguar had escaped, which made a lot of, uh, sort of counteracted some of that. So we got some visitors. So it was all up and down straight away. And that winter, I wrote the book, um, We Bought a Zoo. And it was uh, received really well, went all around the world, and made into 24 different languages. And I got used to people calling me up saying, from foreign countries, saying, one guy, I remember he said, ah, oh, Mr. Me, he's from Argentina. He said, I sell, I read your book. Sorry about the accent. Um, I sell my house, I buy a horse farm. I'm like, no, 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 not my problem. I don't blame me for that. That's not a good idea. And then one day I got a phone call from a lady with an American accent saying, ah, oh, gee, Mr. Me, uh, I read your book. It made me laugh, it made me cry all the ingredients for a great movie. I'm like, mm, thank you very much. So I'm calling from 20th Century Fox. I'm like, oh, hello, yes, I'm <laughs> all ears. And it was Julie Yorn who ended up being the producer of the film. And she said, could they buy the right to make the film, which is not the same thing as making the film. It gives you a little bit of money, and then if they want to make it, they will. And she said, it's a one in 10 chance of actually making it. Don't get your hopes up. So I didn't, but I did get these weird phone calls from America every now and again with the same area code for Hollywood. I think I'll take that call. One of my favorites, I remember, I was trying to build a tree house for the kids. Still not finished, now they've nearly grown up. Um, and it was Julie, and she said, okay, Ben, you need to fix, you need to choose which Hollywood A-lister plays you in the movie. I'm like, well, uh, I don't have a list on me of people uh, who might do that. She said, go ask your friends. So if anyone's ever asked their friends which Hollywood A-lister should play them in a movie, it's a humbling experience. <laughs> I had Hugh Grant was suggested, which I didn't quite understand, and, and Bruce Willis for some reason. I don't know why that might be. Um, but one friend did say Matt Damon. And I thought, well, Matt Damon, yeah, he's quite cool. I, I'd like the Bourne films, and I'd watched all of those, and some of you little ones might not have seen those. But uh, I thought, yeah, he's cool. And I watched the making of the Bourne films when I was in France. And it looks like, you know, he's a nice guy on set. Everybody likes him. He's kind of, you know, quite, an, uh, you know, a, a personable guy, interested in the environment. He wrote Good Will Hunting to get a part in the film. And he got an Oscar for the screenplay. I think, OK, Matt Damon, I'll, you know. So next time Julie called, I said, how about Matt Damon? She said, good choice. I'll go ask Matt. It's like they're always in the same room, these people. I go, Matt, will you play Ben? And, but it was three months before I got another call. And I was clearing the drain at the bottom of the drive. I remember it was flooded. I had to have my arm down the drain in a puddle. And uh, Hollywood area code phone call, I thought, I'll take that. And it was the agent from Los Angeles. And he said, hi, Ben, I've just pulled over on Sunset Boulevard. I'm like, oh, really? That's nice. <laughs> it's raining here. Um, he said, I've got some great news. Matt Damon has agreed to play you in the movie. And it's like, wow, this little zoo that's struggling against the recessions and the weather. The, you know, the, there were so many wet summers, five summers back to back, where farmers' markets have been washed away in August. And a recession it means people are poor, and it's wet, and they don't want to come to the zoo. And we need people, we need people hanging on by our fingernails. Suddenly, a Hollywood film. And I don't know if you're the little ones, but the grown-ups, everybody's seen Monty Python and Holy Grail. And there's a bit there where God speaks directly to Arthur, the clouds part, and he says, Arthur, like this, and changes his life. And it was like that, it was like, Matt Damon is gonna play you in a movie. And it's like, whoa, and I thought, okay. And I come, it was like the sun came out and I looked up the drive and I thought, maybe we're gonna make it. If we can hang on for as long as it takes to make a film, maybe this is gonna survive. It was a long 18 months. I went to the bank and I said, don't worry, don't worry. Matt Damon's going to play me in a movie. <laughs> That's exactly what they said. And they just, mm -hmm. 
madman may increase the repayments from him. <laughs> but eventually they uh, decided, they, they went ahead and they built a new zoo in Hollywood. That's uh, our, Jaguar, uh, our tiger enclosure replica there. And they flew us over. They'd said, they said, uh, okay, Ben, you can come over to the set. We'll fly you first class, but if you bring the kids, it's gonna have to be economy. So I said, sorry kids, you can't come. No, I didn't. <laughs> there they are, look, there's little Milo, maybe 10 years old there, back then. And uh, that's Matt Damon and the director, Cameron Crowe, still in touch with him, not so much with Mr. Damon. Um, and here we are on the, film, on the film set, and the kids pushed past Scarlett Johansson, who was dressed as a zookeeper, and they didn't really recognize her, hadn't done any of the Avengers films by then. This is like her first, one of her first big breaks. And um, to play with Crystal the monkey, because they recognized her from Night at the Museum 2. So she spent a lot of time with Crystal instead of Scarlet. I had lunch with her and everything. It's like, great, good choice, kids. But um, I knew I had to have something to show to the bank when I got back and say, look, this is happening, guys. This is a really big thing. It's going to change our fortunes. Be nice to us for a bit, and the money will come back. And I, when I met Matt Damon, I said to him, would you mind posing for me, with me, with a Dartmoor Zoo t-shirt on so that we can show that as advertising on our website? So it's like a personal endorsement. And his advisor said right in front of me, I don't think that's a very good idea, Mr. Damon. And I was like, thank you very much, mate. And he said, Matt Damon said, yeah, I will do that for you. But first, I have to do some filming. And I'll get back to you. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe he will, maybe he won't, but whatever. And as the day wore on, uh, I, it got less and less likely that he was going to turn up. But then suddenly, there he is. He turns up, and he honors his uh, promise to wear the T-shirt. And that photograph is still on the website of the zoo, because it shows uh, that we're not like every other zoo, because we've had a film made about us. What I like about this is a couple of things. One is that even from the back, you can see the difference between English teeth and Hollywood teeth. And also, okay, so he's an Oscar-winning, nice guy, megastar, but he's not quite as tall as me, is he? No way. So here he is being nice to the kids, leaving a message on uh, Milo's Nintendo for the third time while he tried to find the record button. Very nice with children. Here he is later at the uh, premiere, and I like this because he's mirroring, I don't know if you know that phrase, where an actor copies your man, your, everything you're doing. He's copying me, I'm twiddling a ring. He's not got a ring on that finger, but he's twiddling. And you can also really see the height difference in this picture. It's <laughs> very significant. So straight back from Hollywood to medical emergency at the zoo. Unscheduled, no budget for this. 2,000 uh, pounds. Tammy, no, sorry, this is Taz, Tammy's sister. Old tiger trod on her claw and it got stuck and went septic. And this is how tigers die in the wild. They did a little injury like that that makes them not be able to hunt. But tigers in zoos live longer because you give them vet uh, uh, treatment. And you can see the high-tech tongue monitor there and the high-tech broom that we use, which is actually an early warning system. So if, if she starts to wake up, the person holding the broom feels it, shouts a warning, and everyone runs away. And I've seen it happen. And people run so fast when a tiger stands up. It's like really fast. But this time, she didn't stand up. And we got the claw out, which was smelled horrible. And it's now uh, an exhibit in the education room. Same time, oh yes, this is, this is how we stopped it happening again. Keep her claws nice and short, big scratching post, donated by the Royal Marines, a lot of Royal Marines down in Plymouth. And it gave me an idea, which we'll come to in a bit. Here's Luther, who was uh, stillborn. Uh, no, stillborn, what am I saying? <laughs> Breach birth. So, and nearly stillborn. He, was, he couldn't walk, he could only just breathe, and we literally gave him mouth to mouth, brought him into the vet room, swapped his straw with the mum's straw for three months, milked the mum. Uh, he's a tapir, a Brazilian tapir. And when he was ready, we gave him to the mum, and he's, she reared him, and he's now a father in another zoo, and I'm very proud of him. He's a lovely boy. That branch, you can see, snapped just before we opened to the public into the tiger enclosure. So the tigers are just coming out in the morning 
And that happened right in front, luckily, right in front of me. And I was able to come on the radio and say, um, <laughs> close the zoo and put the tigers back. And the tigers, luckily, a bit lazy, and they looked at that and they thought, it, it does look like a ladder, but quite a slippery ladder, so let's not bother. And I spent two days up there cutting that free, and it was a minus 20 wind chill. I remember that bit. So my next book is going to be called Never Buy a Zoo. Because <laughs> lots of things like that. If I hadn't been there at the time, they could have got out from there, and it was just, you're just not expecting that. That's, yeah. This was a... a stable donated to us by Tesco's, uh, who we, uh, we did a team building day with Tesco's, and here they are, they're paying us to put up fence posts that they have bought. Now, I like that, that is a win, 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 isn't it? It was fantastic, and it meant that we got zebras, so everybody won, and it's a magical thing, and we do a lot of that sort of thing now. This is also an advert, Philips make lighting like this and they said um, would we use their lighting 20,000 pounds worth of dimmable eco-friendly LED lighting if we can uh, advertise it on the internet because we've got a lot of Facebook friends now and suddenly everybody wants to be friends with us and I said uh, yes so you've got free lighting amazing lighting you need a degree in electronics to use the dimmer facility but we have people who have that so it's fine this, I got a letter from the University of Plymouth saying, uh, I, well, I thought it was going to say, we've noticed you've been parking in our car park <laughs> without a permit. But actually it was, would I accept an honorary doctorate for services to the community and resilience? And I thought, you get a doctorate for that. But I said, yeah, okay, and thank you very much. And it was really, it's because we've had 150 students have passed through and done studies on our animals, because I say yes. When people say, can come and look at your animals, I tend to say yes. And lots of zoos say, oh, no, you might get in the way, we don't do that, what's the point? And I say, yes, you can, because the more we study them, the more use that information might be in looking after them in the future. We have a lot of students on site, and we teach some of them ourselves now. Uh, so with this information, I said to the university, thank you for that. Um, this is one of my research areas. There's a thing called biophilia. And it just means the effect of nature on people. And people benefit from being outside, as, as everybody kind of knows instinctively, because we're animals. We're just animals like every other animal. It's just we've invented buildings, and we tend to spend much more time inside buildings than is good for us. And actually, learning outside the classroom and working outside and walking outside is really, really good for you. And the term for that is biophilia, and there are lots of different studies on it. And I read, I'd written an article for the independent newspaper in the year 2000. I was interested in this. I'd gone to uh, uh, dig some rhododendrons out of a, a country estate in Scotland uh, for a week to uh, write about biophilia. And suddenly, here I am, I've got a zoo full of trees. It's 30 acre trees, uh, uh, wood, woodland, with a lot of leaves that fall in the, in the autumn. And it means that you need a lot of people to come and help. And I noticed that the people who come and help actually feel better for it. And we started doing studies on it. And I noticed they feel even better if you scare them a bit with a lion. And there are certain groups of people, soldiers in particular, soldiers who've been into war and come back, sometimes terrible experiences. And they used to call it shell shock. And now it's called post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of the things that they really like is being scared by lions. And we got them to stand between those two lions that you've just seen and build an enclosure that mixes the two so the male can walk in and across to the female. And every day there'll be lions roaring at them and they will be working with their friends, doing physical hard work. I remember one of the PE instructors said, that bloke there pushing that wheelbarrow up with cement, he says his knees hurt when he does a squat in the gym, but look at him now. And of course they're all shouting and playing with each other as they're soldiers and every now and again they get this roar, and roar like this. And they love it. And at the end of the day, they're tired, they've had some fun, they've done something good, and they, what do they do? They go and talk to the psychiatrist. And we found that there's a huge spike in what they call breakthrough conversations after volunteering at the zoo with the big cats uh, when they go back to base. So that's something we're really doing a lot with, with soldiers in particular, but also 
children who've been excluded from school. It's the same kind of thing. We've got six at the moment, or six last year, who went on from being excluded to taking GCSEs because we employed them at the zoo, really, to build some decking for us, but we got them to uh, work with the animals as well. Here are the soldiers putting up a big platform for us, and see me at the back there, hiding from the rain. <laughs> I don't like the rain. That's why I moved to the south of France. I moved from the driest part of the south of France back to the wettest county in England. And there I am again. Everyone's smiling except me, because it's raining. But one of these guys, has been, he's been five tours of Afghanistan and Iraq, and he said, being in there, mate, it's like being on ops. So it's not like going into Helmand province. He said, said, eight out of 10? So it's amazing. So I said, it's not as dangerous as that. He goes, we don't know. He said, we don't know you. We just saw a very dangerous cat going in there, and he might come out any minute. As far as they're concerned, it's really exciting, but it's safe. So it, does, it ticks all the boxes of adrenaline, which is what they need at this stage in their lives, uh, but safely. That's Tim, our laughing boy, uh, well-being officer and maintenance guy. Now this is uh, the cocoon. I can't remember if it's the Science Museum or the Natural History Museum. And it's an exhibit of scientists. If you go in there, you see actual scientists at work. And I love that uh, because it shows young people that you can have a job in science. And I said to the university, look, we've got a bare patch of land here. You give me a doctorate. Our restaurant's full of your students. We need a classroom that we can use as an exhibit to show people scientists at work, like animals, because we're all animals. Put it here. I said, you can have the wooden one or the glass one. Which do you go for? Obviously, the glass one's a bit more expensive. So they went for the wooden one. And there it is, look, the Dartmoor Institute of Animal Science. It really exists. And it's got these big doors that often open, full of students working, and signs on the door saying, please don't tap on the glass. It frightens the scientists. And adverts for different courses with different ways that people can end up working in science and just with animals as well. And you often see people bringing their mum and dads up there going, mummy, mummy, what are they doing? And you can see maybe it sows a seed in their minds that there's another way of, uh, another job available. When we got the place, I thought I'll be playing with orangutans within three years. After 12 years, we have marmosets. But I'm still smiling because it's great. This one I really like. This is Vlad, a friend of mine. He's died now. Old, old tiger. He's actually unconscious, but his, his eyes are open. And this is the second time he's been knocked down to explore. A, he had a little lump in his throat. And the first time, the vet had shown me where this thing was. And I had to put my hand, hand in and feel where this lump was. So the second time, the vet, different vet said, right, Ben, where's this lump? Curator lifts up the, the animal head. And this time his eyes are open, and I have to put my hand in the mouth. And there's this pause. <laughs> and it was, it was a very serious thing. I mean, you know, there's a guy with a gun in the background. Everybody's professional. And so I'm just going, mm. what's the tiger looking at me? And I don't want to put my hand in his mouth. I was really interested in that. You don't just go, yeah, it's down here. You can't get over the fact that it's a massive, dangerous animal. Now, this is the right reaction. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not every audience does that. Some of them just sit there and go, what? Meerkats are a health resource. I told this to the chairman of our local hospital. I said, if you put meerkats in your hospital, everyone will chill, everyone will calm down. Patients, patients' children, uh, and staff. And they looked at me like I was mad, and then said, OK, let's do it. So the hospitals in Devon and Cornwall, uh, and a, a mental health unit in particular, are, have agreed that Dartmoor Zoo is going to supply them with meerkats and we'll look after them ourselves, or we'll train people there to look after them. And we've done a, st with a, st a study going on to show that it will actually increase everybody's well-being in those places. Uh, so when you hear about that on the news, it's us. Pioneering work there with these little critters. And I think, oh, I've got loads of time. I, I think next is going to be the videos that, uh, that we um, downloaded at the end. Um, basically. When you're living in the zoo, after 6 o'clock, everybody's gone. And I tend to walk around a lot with my children and my dogs and say hi to the cats, the big cats. Some of them are friendly, that you can were hand-reared, and you can sort of stroke them through the bars occasionally. You must not ever let the public do that, because if they turn or if they do this, they can break your fingers. So you've got to know what you're doing. Of course, we try it, we do it. My children think I take too many risks. Um, but recently, we got a jaguar. 
uh, was sovereign died of old age, and we got a new boy who came from France uh, called Chincha. And he was really frightened when he first arrived. There was a storm as he crossed the channel. They're very clever cats. They're very worried. Uh, when he came out of the, the crate, he hid in the house, and he wouldn't come out. And we were saying to him, Chincha, it's OK, it's OK. And he just wouldn't even look at us. And then I thought, he's never heard English. I know from psychology that dogs who are brought up in England prefer listening to French compared to, say, Chinese, because they can tell it's a European language. Animals can tell the difference between languages. So I thought, he's never heard English. So I said, c'est pas grave, mon gros chaton, tu es tellement beau. Saying, you're a lovely big kitten and you're beautiful. And he immediately, he looked right at me like this. He said, he's like, tu parles français? And he came, he, not that time, but the next time I came in, he rolled over on his back like that. And he's still difficult with the keepers, but when I go and talk to him in French, he lies down and rolls over. And I hope this video is going to come next. And I'm making the mistake with the clicker like I always do. Oh, this is a different one. This is us saying goodbye to the tiger, who we introduced to Vernon, my dog. And it took four years for the tiger to stop scaring the dog and admit that he is all right, he's going to be my friend. <laughs> you might hear the tiger go, <laughs> which is a hello. And here's the one with Chincha, playing like a cat. You hear him crunching on that stick like he wishes it was your finger. He's not like Vlad. What I like about this is he's not hand reared, but he's still playing playful. He knows there's the fence there. He would get you if he could, but he's just relaxed now. And then you see him blink slowly at the end, which means he's relaxed. So if you want to relax a cat, big or small, blink slowly and yawn. And they'll start blinking and yawning. goes, trying to trick me into putting my hand in.